Hello, my name is Alice and today we're here to talk about Emmanuel's book, Bruce Howard, Volume 1 and 2. So we have a few questions for him. So Emmanuel, how did you first get into writing? Um, I honestly have no idea. <laughs> I, I remember um, my uncle bought me a very old MS-DOS computer and right. it didn't yeah, have really that. anything else to do but type on it. So I started writing stories, oh. coming up with ideas, and then it just went from there. But in terms of... So you were pretty young then? Yeah. Fourth grade, I think. What, what is that for English people? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, ten? Ten. Ten, okay. Yeah, I was ten oh. years old. Cool. So, yeah, writing a lot of stories. And I actually haven't seen them in a while, but I remember when I was in college, I found the files with the stories on them, and I was reading them and just like laughing because of... <laughs> The idea of like a robotic werewolf versus a real werewolf and <laughs> the things that it would just come up in my head, I guess, was strange. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. <clears throat> and so you've just carried on kind of doing bits since then? Yeah, on and off. I'm a, I'm kind of a hobby junkie, meaning I have too many hobbies. And so, you know, one year I'll paint, one year I'll write, one year I'll do filmmaking, <laughs> one year it'll be something else. So. Writing has always been on and off. I'll do it for a little while, then take a break, and then come back and do it again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um, okay. So this leads to my next question, which is, what inspires you in your writing? Everything. Um, I actually had a friend who told me one time, whenever you're on a bus or on a train, just look at a person and they just try to make up a story about where they're coming from or where they're going or mm -hmm. anything like that. And so... To that point, I take stories from everywhere. It could be just a jerk that I saw or who I work with, and then I'll just like develop that into some kind of story. Like a lot of the stories that I've written in this book, mm -hmm. the names will be familiar if the person knew that they were reading about themselves. Because it, <laughs> I'll take the name of the person, you know, change the last name, and then write about what a how much I don't like, or do like the person. There are some characters in the book where it's a person that I actually really like and wanted to put their name in the book. So mm -hmm. it, the, the inspiration for the writing comes all over the place, but it's usually like situations or interactions with people. Okay, cool. So most of the characters in the book are based on... Um, yes. I mean, I'm trying to think. Some of them are not. But there are some that are, for example, there's one character in there who has the same name as a girl that I dated. Okay. And here's the problem with it. it. In the book, she's an evil character, but in real life, she's not an evil person. But I was just trying to think of a name, and that was a name that popped up. And I was okay. like, okay, I'll change it later. And I never changed it. <laughs> so now she's like the most evil person in the book, and I didn't, I didn't mean to. So she has the same name as your ex-girlfriend. Yeah, well, one of, a girl I used to date. I won't say ex-girlfriend, okay. but a girl I used to date. And so she was a really nice person. She really is nice, but she's the most evil person in the book so far. So yeah. Um, okay, so what about Bruce? Um, Bruce was actually inspired by, okay, kind of a long story, but I'll try to make it short. I was trying to write another novel, another book, and I got stuck, and it wasn't going the way I wanted it to go. And I was sitting with my son one day, and there's this thing called uh, Cars Tunes, and it's based off of the Disney Cars uh, movies, mm -hmm. and they do little short cartoons that are five minutes long. And one of the stories was about a detective. It was Mater, the, the tow truck, as a detective in a noir film. And I was like, okay, well, let me write that. So I wrote one short story as a way to kind of get out of the writer's block for the other book. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of turned into Bruce and adding more and more elements and more and more things. And then whenever I had someone else read it, they were always like, okay, but I see a lot of you in the book, or I see a lot of situations that you're in in the book. And so it was going back and reading is kind of true. There are a lot of like scenarios and situations that I'm in where mm -hmm. it, I put it into the book, or I react, I put the character in a situation, and then I write how I would react to it mm. in the same circumstance. Okay. Cool. So. so basically, this book is a distraction method for you writing another book. Mm hmm. Did you ever actually finish No, no, that's the thing. That's the funny part. I've written this one and then I wrote the second one, volume one and volume two. And now I have plans to write another book, Guardian Angel, starting in November or December. The same characters? No, no, that's different. That's different. And then 
It'll be maybe I'll try to pick up that novel. But I've been trying to write that novel since 2007. Wow. Okay. And I still, I, I keep saying I'm going to write it. And I, I have all the papers. I have outlines, chapters. I know exactly what I want to write. I just haven't mm -hmm. put it to the paper yet. Mm -hmm. Don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so. You can use fact it. That's yeah, right. exactly. It's like procrastination <laughs> yes. times nine years. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so you are what I would call a self-publisher. Yes. Is that the right term for it? Is that what you call it? Um, indie writers, self-published writers, yeah. Just people who take their own works and publish them online. And it pretty, at least for me, mm -hmm. um, it pretty much comes from being too impatient. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, companies, when you want to publish a book, they'll say, okay, well, send us the manuscript. A lot of them only want you to send it to them. Mm -hmm. And then they say, oh, it'll take from six to six months, six weeks to six months to reply. And then it's like, okay, then you get a rejection, you know, two months later. Oh, great. So I wasted two months sending you my book. And now yeah. I have to go send it to another person who wants me to wait for them to say no. Wow. So the online publishing and actually being able to publish it as a paperback is a great way to circumvent that. And there are a lot of people. I actually did an event yesterday. Um, the Indie Writers Cooperation, actually, on October 8th, mm -hmm. which was yesterday. We had an event. Or they had an event that I joined where it was a bunch of indie writers mm. um, sharing their experiences, answering questions, how they promote books and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this. So, it's, so a, it's like a growing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially since a lot of people tend to have gravitated towards reading on their Kindles and, and reading yeah. ebooks as opposed to paperback or hardcover. And even if you do want to read a paperback, it's published in paperback. So mm -hmm. you can order it yourself. There's a. Um, a lot of advantages to doing that. There's a lot of drawbacks too. So, mm -hmm. like the editing and the proofreading part, trying to catch mistakes grammatically, you know, that right, stuff. Before yeah. it gets printed and yeah, you exactly. change it. Exactly. Okay, okay. So. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, and so, for your next book, would you advocate um, self publishing? Or, like, is that the route now that you're happy to take? Um, yes, as soon as I figure out this promotion thing okay, okay. <laughs> and how to get it out there, but. Yes, but then again, to to be fair, I don't know any other way. I don't know the way of um, taking your manuscript to a company and having them go through it and say, okay, it's okay, and mm -hmm. all that jazz. I know I submitted the first couple of Bruce Howard books or stories. I submitted to a couple of magazines that said it's exactly what I said, like, you know, just wait a couple mm -hmm. of weeks, and then they would say no, and then I was like, oh, well, mm -hmm. great. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Then I published them online. I got a lot of downloads, a lot of responses, and I thought, okay, well, why am I, who buys magazines anymore anyway? Not mm -hmm. really, at least not those kinds. And mm -hmm. if they do, is there really a benefit for me? So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's just better, I believe, to go that route, but cool. who knows? Okay. Yeah, it works. <laughs> yeah, um, and is this your first collection of stories about detective? No, the first one, volume one, came out in 2011. Okay. And this is the second one, volume two. Um, yeah, five years later. So. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but uh, the first one was uh, Bruce Howard, uh, Gentleman with Brass Knuckles. So. Uh -huh, okay, yeah. yeah. And so this is them both together. Yes, yeah, so I'll put both of them together because right. if you read volume two without volume one, you could understand it, but it would you get a lot more context if mm -hmm. you read the first one. So mm -hmm. might as well put them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, and who are your favorite authors? Uh, J.K. Rawlings. I love Harry Potter. I'm reading it in German now to try to practice my German. So, yeah, um, J.K. Rawlings, Michael Crichton, uh, a lot of his, like Jurassic Park, Kong of this. I used to be in those books so much when I was a teenager. Timeline was one of my favorite books, even though I can acknowledge it's not the greatest. <laughs> it's not even, there's no um, literary... You're not going to really enrich your life from reading that book, but I liked it. Um, Kurt Vonnegut. I never know how to say his name, but... Oh, right. Yeah, I know what you mean. I yeah, V-O-N-N-E-G-U-T. Yeah. I love his writing. It's like, those are one of the few books, like, his books. And um, Greg McDonald, he wrote the Fletch series, mm -hmm. which is about a detective who's kind of a wise-ass. Mm -hmm. um, those are the two kinds of, those are the two authors that can literally make me laugh out loud while I'm reading. It's so funny. Um, yeah, John Grisham, although a lot of his books end the same way. 
uh, Dan Brown, although he's figured out a formula and he's sticking to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. kind of, yeah, he's definitely sticking to that formula. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's... Okay, so you have like a whole kind of range, it's not just like detective stories that you read. No. Funny read. enough, when we were talking about it before, I was trying to think, and the only like real detective stories that I read, when I was little, I read Encyclopedia Brown religiously, I used to love him. And then the Greg McDonald Fletch series, I read like three of those books, and I want to read the other ones, but I usually don't really read detective mm -hmm. novels or mystery novels, which mm -hmm. is strange. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, just strange, maybe because you ended up writing one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe that's good then. Um, and how important was it to you in, in Volume 1 that the stories had a through line going through them? Um, yes, and it was important that I think the person could grow with the main character and a couple of the, of the side characters, but it wasn't nearly as pivotal as it was in the second book because mm -hmm. in the first book it was supposed to be more episodic like I, mm -hmm. I say I described the first book as toilet reading where you could just mm -hmm. like leave the book in the bathroom and then whenever you went to do your business just <laughs> you know like read a story and be you know okay with it and then leave it there and just read it again later and actually after what happened at the end of the first one there was a through line degree with the character and then the tenth story you end up with a situation where okay, it can't be so episodic anymore. Like mm -hmm. there's the thing that he did changed a lot of scenarios, changed his life in a really big way. So you can't ignore that. You can't, you know, just, you know, kind of write that away and say, oh, well, everything's fine. It doesn't, you know, nothing changes. You know, it's not possible for that to happen. Right, okay, yeah. So, so then that impacts on volume two. Yeah, exactly. And it made it to where you couldn't, where volume two ended up being a lot more like a novel than a collection of short stories like the first one. Yeah. And you couldn't just pick it up in the middle and be okay with it. There was a yeah. lot of stuff that you had to go with beforehand. And yeah, so and, and volume two was much more important than it was in volume one. In volume one, it was just, yeah, you should grow with the character a little mm -hmm. bit, but it's more about the story. And so you could just pick it up, put it yeah, down. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, yeah, volume two definitely has a very different feel to mm -hmm. it. Um, and yeah, I think as a reader, you feel more like, invested. Oh, really? In okay. Characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can see what. Well, then. When you get to the, you know, to see what happens. Yeah. Which character? So, I guess without giving too much away, which character do you feel most invested in? Was it in the main character himself? Yeah. Or, okay, yeah. because the funny thing is, is that there's one person I'm thinking of right now who despises the main character, like really does not like the main character. Mm -hmm but kept reading because of like the, the situations that he was in or putting himself in okay. and that the only character that she actually liked or found redeeming was Timmy. Yeah, that was Timmy the, of course, yeah. yeah, he's my second favorite. Yeah, that was the only character that she actually liked in the entire book <laughs> and so she was just like, I don't like any of these people. What about Maggie? Maggie, actually another friend of mine was telling me that Maggie felt more like the conscience of the book, where she oh, was kind of like trying to guide him. Mm. And actually she's based on a friend of mine. Hi Maggie. She's based on a, f a friend of mine. Um, and I guess it wasn't intentional, but it, it does work itself out that way to where she's kind of like a guiding light for him in volume two. So yeah, she's pretty nice. That. Yeah. So I guess that was a character that was just kind of needed in order to push him forward. Mm. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. okay, interesting. Um, all right, and so if you had to write a story about any other character apart from Bruce, is there one that you would go to straight See, yeah, okay, we talked about this before. I might change my answer now because the more I think about it, uh, I guess Timmy or Hope mm. because not to give too much away and to say things to give it away, but you would, I think you would get why I would say hope. Mm -hmm. And I guess you have to read it to see, to understand why I would say that. But also with all the stuff that Timmy went through in the book, getting what happened from his perspective, like the perspective mm -hmm. of a child seeing all the stuff going on mm -hmm. would probably be a very interesting thing to write at, at the minimum. So, and especially with how, Volume two ends like the last three stories in volume two. 
Yeah. It would be very interesting to get his perspective on those events, I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think maybe we've already talked about this, but Volume 2 has a completely different feel to mm-hmm. it than Volume 1. Mm-hmm. So when you first started writing Volume 1, did you have any idea that it was going to end up where it has ended up? No, not at all. Um, so with the, with Volume 1, to be completely honest about it, they had absolutely no plan whatsoever. I just started writing stories with the first one, liked it with the second one. Like mm-hmm. I just kept going on and thought, oh, well, if I do like 10 of these, I can make a book. Okay. And that was kind of the thought process. And I think that's also why the book ended up a lot more episodic, mm-hmm. a lot more like, okay, this story and then this story and then this story mm-hmm. with like a with characters going through Mm -hmm. as opposed to volume two where it was okay well here are these characters the ones that are left from volume one Mm -hmm. and there's this huge event with Bruce Howard Mm -hmm. so now what and it can't be just explained away in you know a couple of stories Mm -hmm. it has you have to see how it affects his life Mm -hmm. and it'll have a huge effect on his life so that's where like with volume two I had the plan I knew what the end of it was going to be. I told you, like, what the, the alternative ending was. And the, the ending now changed a bit because of a certain character in Volume 2 that happened to pop up, coincidentally. Um, so it changed the end a little bit, but there was always going to be that conflict, kind of like what I explained before. And so the start of Volume 2, I started it two times, stopped both mm-hmm. times, just didn't get into it, found out about the downloads and got kind of motivated. Yeah, because you said there was a five year gap between yeah, volume one. Exactly. And, and so then I had like, once I found out how many downloads that they were receiving, I got more motivated and wrote it. But I, but from the big, from the end of volume one, I knew how I wanted volume two to end. I just never got to it. Okay. And then when I wrote it. So it was it, kind of playing in your head for those five years. You were sort of Oh yeah, exactly. I knew exactly stuff. what was going to happen. Yeah. And so then I started writing the first story and I liked where that went. And the end of the first story was actually a surprise to me too. I just wrote it and just went like, I think I have this hot, this habit of doing this. I've done it with short stories too, where I'll write myself into a situation and I'm like, oh, what the hell? Like, how do I get out of this? I don't plan. I'm like, damn. And then I have to like try to figure it out. And so then the next story after that is actually me figuring it all the way out. And funny enough, uh, not to give too much away, I had no idea. Like, I had no idea how that was going to end or how it was going to resolve itself. And I found myself, like, typing the story, and then that doesn't make sense, going back and, like, rewriting it, and then, like, trying to figure out a way to make this path work. And sometimes I would write something, and it would take me further away from where it would end. And I was like, well, damn, I don't want to write that, but it's actually really good, so I can't take mm-hmm. that away. So now I have to find a way to solve it. Mm-hmm. And so that, yeah, there was a lot of off-the-cuff writing. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of interesting about, like, the process. Like, do you follow your set path? Yeah. Or do you let these little tangents happen that might end up in completely different places? Yeah, that's the, I, and I, it's, I usually, at least with this one, with other, with other books, I've had, like, a plan, like, an outline of where I wanted to go. But with this one, it was... Or with Bruce Howard in general, it's just, okay, let's go this way. And it's like, oh, uh, you know what would be really cool if this happened? Well, like that's how um, that certain very, very evil character came about in the first place and where she was supposed to be a small, middling character. It kind of just took a different path and it was interesting to write and I thought it would be interesting to read. And so then she ends up becoming like a major character. And I didn't mean for that to happen, but you know, went down a little path and kept writing and it made sense and it was fun. And so I just kept going. And then in the end, yeah, yeah that was the result. Yeah. So it's kind of like a natural evolution. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Um, okay. So, um, I noticed a theme mm-hmm. in volume two of social conscience mm-hmm. versus personal happiness. Mm-hmm. And is that something that you set out to explore? Is that something that you feel strongly about? This feels like deja vu. <laughs> like we've been here before. Um, uh, actually, and that was like we've discussed it a few times. Just behind the scenes, these cameras have cut off on us so many times. We've discussed this already. But we're going to pretend like we haven't. Um, so, yeah, so we've had the discussion and 
that wasn't an intentional thing for me. The personal response or personal desires versus what's best for society. It was honestly me sticking myself in that situation and wondering, okay, what would I do if given this problem or if given this issue? And I essentially just wrote down my thought process in that scenario where I have to decide about whether it's better for me to protect my family and the people I care about or if I should look towards protecting society as a whole or, you know, thousands or millions of people instead. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't necessarily an intentional like, oh, well, this is a commentary on society. Okay. Here's a mirror. It was more so it was just a just, personal thought process. Yeah. yeah. And then that decision in the book really yes. plays out. And I, I mean, because I sort of found that you came back to those questions like a few times. Yeah. And yeah. it really plays out. And then, uh, and then at the end, yeah. At the end, it's interesting to see where it's <laughs> Yeah, this is true. And like I was asking you, so you would pick similarly to what was picked in well, the I book. don't know. It's a hard, it's a hard decision, isn't it? It's yeah. like one of those, it's a catch-22. There is no right, there is no wrong. It's... Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a hard one. Yeah. But that's what makes it so interesting, that kind of debate. Hopefully it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I know, I think it is. Um, so, yeah, so you're a father yourself. Yes. And so I think you can see that in some of your writing when you talk about um, Timmy and Hope, mm -hmm. um, you know, Bruce's feelings for them. Is mm -hmm. that something that you took from your own life? Um, yeah, to me it was, I've noticed that in a lot of my writings, Daddy and Guardian Angel, that I do a lot of things where it's a reflection of a parent's love for a child or, you know, an adult's, you know, wanting to protect a child, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I do draw on that from my own experience as a father, um, wanting to protect and make sure everything is okay and safe and make those decisions. Um, but I mean, I think it's a theme that can apply to all relationships, friends, family, you know, mm -hmm. husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, the, the desire and the want to take care of someone that you love or protect someone that you love, mm -hmm. I think is a very basic uh, instinct, a very basic need for people, very basic, I guess, obligation, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people can relate to caring for someone to the degree of wanting to protect them or fight for them or care for them or mm -hmm. anything along those lines. And so it's not necessarily intentional, but it does bring itself up a lot in my story. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I guess it's something that's on my mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, and so what about the writing process? Is that something that you enjoy doing? Pain in the ass. <laughs> it's an absolute pain in the ass. Um, like, as you know, because I do filmmaking, when, I, when it comes to writing a script, I'm much more adept at writing dialogues because mm -hmm. I like to talk too much anyway. And so, like, writing dialogues and, like, trying to think of what people would say is a completely different animal. You can, you can just write, like... A dialogue like just between a conversation between people with writing a book or a story you have to be careful not to be repetitive with descriptions and mm -hmm. repetitive with scenarios and not using the same words even like don't use that too much or don't use he said too much or reply you know like I mean just certain words that you just don't want to use over and over and over because you get bored and if you're bored with writing it then the reader is definitely bored of reading it mm -hmm. so trying to craft together the words kind of like a puzzle and put them together to like paint a picture without it being without using too much red mm. or too much blue or too <laughs> much green so okay, yeah it's so it's a pain but it's sad like the thing is is that you don't i remember hearing someone say this and i can't remember who so sorry but they the them saying the writing process is a pain but the satisfying part about it is the book at the end is that yeah story at the end, the article at the end is what sad is why you did the writing. It's not because of the process. Yeah. Like painting, I do it because of the process. I like the process. Mm -hmm. Writing, I do it because of the product at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So Um, okay. And so in light of that, what advice would you give to to new writers or to writers who are struggling with motivation? How do you get past that? And as we said before, patience. You just have to be patient with um, the process in and of itself because it's not, I mean, it can be fun when the words are flowing and everything's coming together really well, but it can be painstaking and take a lot of, I guess, time and thought and even stepping away from it for a little bit or writing. Like, I mean, that's how Bruce started. I was writing one novel and I was 
stuck on it. So I started writing short stories just mm-hmm. to kind of get some ideas going and kind of mm-hmm. develop my writing style. And it ended up being I stuck with this and then didn't finish the other one. So you just have to have patience with it and just know like at the end it's going to be a satisfying product. Mm-hmm. So Okay, patience. That's good. Yeah. Um, so what are you working on next? Um, Guardian Angel is a short story that I wrote. And I actually wrote it around the same time as uh, the Bruce Howard stories and the daddy story. And it's something that I just like put away and I wrote it and just left it. I didn't think it was good enough to publish online. And then when I found out how many, you know, downloads I had, I thought, okay, well, let me go back through my old stuff and publish that and see if there's any like desire for that. And then Guardian Angel got a really big response. And my entire thought process behind Guardian Angel, why I didn't put it out, was I didn't really think it was that good. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a bit rushed. Like, Mm -hmm. there could have been so much more fleshed out in that story. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, well, let's see if I should make it into a novel. And I got the, a lot of people, a lot, quote unquote, relatively speaking, said, um, make it into a novel, write it into a book. Because there's a lot of things that you could, a lot of directions you could go. You could go a lot of, a lot more that you could give to this character and a lot more this character could show so the, the situation itself so um okay, great. hopefully in november we'll start yeah. writing that and try to publish it in march see how that goes okay cool well, yeah. good luck with that yeah thank you well thank you very much for talking to me and uh, thank yeah. you for having me no <laughs> why was the evil character is female I don't know. See, okay, so you brought that up to me before, and I honestly didn't realize it until you said it. Now, in my defense a little bit, there are plenty of evil there male are, characters. There are, but the ones you remember, yeah. the ones you have the big storylines. To your point, yes, the ones that have the big storylines, the ones that you, that stick out in your head, like the, I guess, who you would call the main villain in volume one is a woman. The main villain in volume two are two women. And so where that comes from, I have no idea. Maybe I should check with some ex-girlfriends and see like what happened there. Like maybe they, and that's the thing. And I, I don't know if this came out on camera. I don't know because it's been cutting on and off if we actually talked about it, but there is that one person whose name, there's a the name of a girl that I used to date yeah. who's a main yeah. villain there. Yeah. And she is anything but evil. She is not an evil person whatsoever. And I wrote her name down as the villain with every intention of saying, okay, I'm going to go back and change the name and not do it. I just needed someone to fill in the blank. And then I just never changed it. And so, and she ends up being a hugely evil driving force in the book. And I didn't intend for it to be that way at all. And yeah, well, I mean, why are there all women? I have. No, I, I guess maybe part of it is because it's kind of a smack in the face of him being a womanizer. Maybe okay. that's it, because in volume okay. one, he spends a lot of time just kind of sleeping around and uh, not necessarily disrespectful for, to women, but not really respectful either. Mm. So maybe it's kind of, okay, well, you think you can get away with doing this to women and watch what they do to you, mm. kind of. Thing. Let's hope it's that. So, <laughs> so um, I, I guess that's you'd have, yeah, some ex-girlfriend who really annoyed you. <laughs> Honestly, like in terms of exes, with the exception of maybe two or three that I can think of, I get along with my exes, but like not like we're going out for coffee and drinks or anything. But yeah. like, yeah. there's no evil wishes, <laughs> at least not from my side. Maybe if you ask them, it's something different. There's no like evil wishes yeah. or anything like that. It's just you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, get along, so I don't know.